Welcome to our discussion, The Rise of Modern Texas, in which we're going to look at the state for the roughly 25 years after the end of World War II. We'll focus, I'll focus a lot on the political situation, um, but we'll also look at the, um, briefly at the economic situation. <clears throat> well, over this 25 year period, the state had a, a really tremendous increase in manufacturing industry, in the petroleum business, both the extraction and transportation of petroleum, as well as the processing of petroleum in huge petrochemical factories that uh, covered many miles along the coast. And agriculture also increased during this period. What's very interesting is the role of air conditioning helping the economy of Texas, which is, those of us who live here all know, is a hot and humid state. And air conditioning was first developed um, before World War II to use in large textile factories. But afterwards, um, it was used in more and more office buildings and increasingly in homes. And there is an optional article in the module that you might want to read. It's about the development of air conditioning throughout the United States, but it's of particular importance to the southern states. Also, in the mid to late 1960s, the major oil companies moved their headquarters from New York City to Houston for two reasons. One, were the lower taxes. Um, both New York City and New York State had corporate income taxes, and so the companies could um, stop paying them if they moved to Houston, where in general the cost of living was less. And also it was a much friendlier business environment over, overall. I personally moved to Houston in the late 1960s when I was in high school. My father worked for a large uh, oil company uh, headquartered in uh, New York City. And we, uh, we, along with many, many thousands of others, moved down to the Houston area. In fact, the high school I graduated from in the Spring Branch area of 600 graduating seniors, uh, about one half of us, about 300, had just moved to Houston the year before because of the massive move from New York City to Houston. <clears throat> well, I was one of those who gone to Texas. I went to Texas uh, during this period of time in my family. And the population of Texas increased from 1950 to 1970 by almost one half, by 45%. And by 1970, the population of Mexican Americans uh, had more than doubled and was the largest minority. And in fact, it actually became the largest minority in 1947. Uh, both the textbook and I are using the phrase Mexican American rather than Hispanic or Latino um, because the vast, vast majority of what we now call Hispanics or Latinos were from Mexico. But I, I used uh, the terms interchangeably, some also. Now, Texas really maintained during this period of time its cultural connection to the South. And we've seen that previously. Um, eight of the 11 million Texans who were residing in the United States during this, excuse me, in Texas during this period of time um, were born in the state. But of the three million who came into the state, uh, most of them came from other southern states. And two thirds of the Anglos in the state actually had ties to the South. By 1970, the vast majority, 80% of residents in Texas lived in towns of 2,500 or more. Houston was the largest city with over 1 million residents. And by 1970, Texas had moved up from being the sixth most populous state to the fourth most populous state in the United States. And of course, today, it's the second most populous after California. <clears throat> the textbook has the 
rather interesting section on the rise of professional spectator sports. Uh, I won't go into all the details if you're interested. Um, be sure to read those three or four pages. But what you had at this time was you had modernization in general, urbanization, which we just looked at, and significant population growth. And this all resulted in Texas becoming a state with many, many professional sports. At first, football had dominated at the high school level and then the college level. And in fact, in the 1960s, um, the Southwest Conference of College uh, Football was really at its heyday. Then professional football, I won't say invaded the state, but came to the state and became and remains very, very popular. <clears throat> this is a program for a game that was held in 1960 between the Houston Oilers football team and the Dallas Texans, as they were called at the time. Uh, you can see the Dallas Texans, very Texas image, a cowboy, you know, with a gun. And the Dallas Texans actually relocated to Kansas City a few years later in 1963 and became the Kansas City Chiefs. And you can see down there the Houston Oilers. This is a real iconic image of Texas. The oil wells in the background and the football player doesn't have a football player on, but the hard hat of a um, oil roof, oil worker. <clears throat> Over the 30 year period up to 1980, Texas had professional and very, very competitive uh, sports franchises in football, baseball, and basketball, sort of the three major American sports. At this time, there were very, very few people who played uh, what we call soccer, the rest of the world calls football. In fact, it was almost unheard of uh, until probably 1990, 1995. And Houston and Dallas um, had teams in all three sports, football, baseball, and basketball. And all sorts of large stadiums were built uh, or parks. Uh, newspapers were full of sports coverage, as was the radio and then television in the mid to late 1950s when it became popular. <clears throat> this is a photo of the, you probably recognize it if you live in the Houston area, the Astrodome. And when it opened in 1965, it was called the eighth wonder of the world. And it wasn't called that just by proud Texans. It was called that by ma uh, many Americans living elsewhere and Europeans. People flocked to the state to see it. I remember my family moved here. When did we move here? 1968. <clears throat> and at the time, you know, it was just incredible. I would take photographs of it. It was just incredible. Now, of course, it's still there. It's not used as a sports stadium, but they they have a, a conventions there and you know special events. And it's next to a very, very large stadium. And actually, it looks quite small today. But in 1965, it was, again, called the eighth wonder of the world. Now let's look at the political situation <clears throat> over this 25 years. And it's really characterized by two things. The Democrats breaking into f factions. You'll see the Democrats who were traditionally very, very conservative in the state, some of them becoming more liberal and being attracted to the national, more to the National Democratic Party, which is becoming increasingly liberal. And yet others remaining Democrats in name, but very disillusioned with their party and sometimes voting for Republicans. And we'll see in subsequent lectures, how many of those Democrats then um, join the Republican Party. So this presents a real opportunity for the Republicans who really have not been a force in politics in Texas since the end of Reconstruction in 1877. You'll recall, we, I spoke in an earlier lecture, the fact that, for instance, in the election for governor, the most important thing 
had been the Democratic primary contest because whoever won the Democratic primary automatically became governor because the Democrats would always win. Now we're going to start to see that changing, and it will change much more after 1970. So in 1945, when World War II ended, conservative Democrats controlled the entire party state government. But there was pressure now from the, the national Democrats who were becoming increasingly liberal. <clears throat> and one, reason, one factor now is after 1945, the United States and the Soviet Union, which had been, of course, allies in World War II, that, that alliance broke. And Americans became increasingly anti-communist in general, both political parties. And then in the early 1950s, there was the so-called Red Scare, uh, characterized by the really exaggerated charges by um, Senator McCarthy. And so many liberal Democrats sort of toned down what they were saying because they didn't want to be charged with disloyalty. So you found many liberals at this time, they were sort of either pushed to centrist positions or actually just left public life. <clears throat> now, in 1946, there was an important election for governor. And again, because the Democrats dominated state politics, what really counted was who won the primary election. Um, <clears throat> Beaufort Jester won. He was a wealthy attorney for the oil industry, and he was serving as the railroad commissioner. And he, he received the support of the conservative Democrats. He, re, he promised to fight la labor unions, communism, and he was also strongly opposed to increased taxes. <clears throat> After his election, uh, labor issues became most important focus. And in 1947, the Texas legislature passed a so-called right-to-work law, and these laws prohibit mandatory union membership as a condition for employment. Now, the labor unions opposed these laws because they said, well, even if the worker doesn't join the union because he or she works in this, uh, in this uh, place, they will automatically receive all the benefits that we fight for. Uh, but these are called right-to-work laws. And they actually spread in many areas in the southern United States. Well, two years later, 1948, Jester was re-nominated um, by the Democratic Party, and then he was elected in the general election. <clears throat> now, the 1948 also produced the most disputed and controversial election in Texas history until this day. And this was the pr Senate primary election among the Democrats. Again, being a Democratic state, all you had to essentially do was win the primary election. And the two candidates were ex-Governor Coke Stevenson and a, a Congressman Lyndon Baines Johnson, who you will recall later becomes president. And they both wanted uh, to be the Democratic senator to replace Senator O'Daniel, who left the Senate in 1948. The conservatives supported Stevenson, who came in first, but there were so many candidates, they had to have a runoff. For his part, Lyndon Johnson reached out to urban voters and ran as a New Dealer, supporting um, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Of course, by this time, Roosevelt was dead. Conservatives said, well, no, he was just a leftist radical. <clears throat> well, it was a very, very close election, and there were allegations of voter fraud on both sides. The initial count of ballots was Stevenson had 362 votes more, more than Johnson, but then there was an amended total, and Johnson won with 87 votes over Stevenson, and it was rather suspect because at the last minute, uh, Johnson's team came up with the results from one election box, uh, which were all for Johnson. And the voters had signed in alphabetical order, and it was actually the same handwriting. 
So it raised lots, lots of questions. Stevenson protested within the Democratic Party, went to the legal system, and he um, still lost. And so Stevenson, having lost the primary, actually came out and supported the Republican candidate. Um, and Johnson uh, won the election. In the 1948 presidential election, <coughs> we had Harry Truman running for re-election. Uh, Harry Truman, of course, had become president in 1944 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt had died in office and, and Truman being his vice president automatically became president. But <coughs> Truman was viewed as too much of a liberal, Demo too liberal for most Texas Democrats. His support for integrating the military, uh, which was done, the U.S. military was integrated in the, um, the previous year, and he wanted to end discrimination in general and federal hiring. And so throughout the South, the segregationist Democrats formed a new party called the Dixiecrats, and they put up a candidate in Texas, Strom Thurmond. Well, the, the Democrats were even more divided here because you have now the, the, um, the very conservative segregationists, you have, but then you also have very liberal Democrats um, outside of Texas supporting Henry Wallace um, as the progressive candidate. So here we have a three-way race uh, nationally, and this really allowed the Republicans an opportunity to win the presidency and uh, win the, in the state of Texas. Um, Truman won, the Democrats won, but the Republicans did very well. And <clears throat> the fact that the Dixiecrats had done poorly gave many Texas conservatives second thoughts about belonging in the Democratic Party, which was, as they saw it, becoming too liberal for them. And so I put here in red, at the bottom of the slide, in general, the more liberal the National Party became, the greater the opportunity there was for the Republicans to receive support from Democrats who were either considered themselves either conservative or a centrist. <clears throat> well, Governor Jester uh, died in 1949, and so his lieutenant governor, Alan Shivers, of course, automatically became governor, and Shivers was easily reelected in 1950. Now, Shivers in the 1948 election had opposed um, President Truman's election. Um, and stood for more conservative values. In 1952, Shivers was re-elected governor again, and the liberal challenger was Ralph Yarborough, whom we'll see a little later. <clears throat> also, in 1950, another conservative, Price Daniel, defeated the liberal Lindley Beckworth in the primary election, and that was to be a successor to Tom Connolly in the U.S. Senate. So the bottom line of this is the conservatives now were strengthening their control of the Texas Democratic Party at the same time that the National Democratic Party is becoming less conservative. Now let's jump ahead to the 1952 presidential election. Governor Shivers and the vast majority of conservative Democrats in Texas refused to vote for the Democratic candidate, Adley Stevenson, on the grounds that he was too liberal. At the 1952 election, the Republican candidate was Dwight Eisenhower, and this is the same famous Dwight Eisenhower from World War II, who U.S. Army General a career uh, military uh, person who he of course had uh, led the invasion of D-Day in June 1944. And Dwight Eisenhower, it's interesting, 
was asked by both the Democrats and Republicans to be their candidate in 1952 because everybody realized he was a national hero and he came out and said something to the effect that, well, you know, I really don't like politics. I'm not, I'm not really a member of either party. But he said he really preferred the Republicans because of their uh, economic policies. Um, but so he was elected uh, nation, nationwide and, of course, re-elected. So Dwight Eisenhower served for eight years. Well, many Texas Democrats voted for Eisenhower. In fact, there were Texas Democrats for Eisenhower signs that popped up throughout the state. And this was a really a transitional movement moment here for conservatives because a good number of conservative Democrats decided to vote for the Republican Party, even though they still remained members of the Democratic Party. Now, overall, in the state of Texas, Eisenhower received 53% of the vote, which is an incredible, incredible given that the party had been solidly Democratic before. And so now the Republicans think, well, Texas could be changed into a, a two-party state like so many other states. As we'll see, this will take a, a num number of like 20, 25 more years. So let's look briefly at the civil rights struggle in, in Texas. Um, you have studied civil rights in um, other courses, I'm sure, where you've looked at the great influence of Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, but I'll, I want to focus in here on Texas. Well, here in Texas, <clears throat> we've already seen you had one party dominance by the Democrats. And that combined with poll taxes, you know, you had to pay a fee to vote. That effectively took the vote away or disenfranchised most blacks and Mexican-Americans in the state. And <clears throat> the minorities in Texas throughout the 1950s were restricted to underfunded and segregated schools. In addition to discrimination in the educational sector, the minorities faced segregation or exclusion from public accommodations, by which you mean restaurants, theaters, swimming pools, and stores. Public accommodation is a locale where anyone from the public could, could go in. Or in some restaurants, you know, the blacks and Mexicans had to, Mexican Americans had to eat back near the kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but politically, the um, Tejanos, here I call them Tejanos, but Mexican Americans or Hispanics um, advanced much faster in the political arena than the blacks. By the early 1920s, Mexican Americans or Tejanos were elected to office as mayors in major cities like San Antonio and El Paso. State legislatures were elected from South Texas, which of course is predominantly um, Latino. And in 1961, the first Mexican American uh, went to the US Congress. <clears throat> now, less than 20% of the blacks who were eligible to vote of the, of the right of voting age um, actually participated in state elections in the 1950s, uh, largely because of obstacles like the poll tax. And when they did vote, they typically supported Republican candidates. Uh, nationwide, liberal Democrats began attracting the, the blacks in the 1950s. And thanks largely to the black uh, vote, the liberal Democrats were able to um, uh, elect Ralph Yarborough, and then later um, President Kennedy was able to win uh, the state of Texas in 1960 election. Now, Barbara Jordan, 
was a black lawyer in the state. And despite the advice of many people, she said that she was going to run for political office. So at first, she ran for the Texas House in 1962 and 64, and she was defeated. However, in 1966, just a few years later, she was elected to the Texas Senate. And she went on from there to, in 1972, to become the first Southern black woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. And she was very, very respected by whites, blacks, everyone in the U.S. House of Representatives, including Republicans, and was actually elected to several positions, uh, leadership positions in the U.S. Senate. Uh, here we see Barbara Jordan in a photo with her two parents. Now, in 1965, a very important piece of legislation was passed by Congress, the Civil Rights Act of 1965. And the same year, the U.S. Constitution was amended, and the 24th Amendment prohibited poll taxes. This had an impact of greatly increasing black voter participation. And so now blacks in Texas started to win seats in the state House of Representatives, in county governments, as well as municipal or city governments. Blacks understandably demanded access to equal education, and initially the focus was on the university level, and a particular significance was the University of Texas in Austin, and as well as racial prohibitions at the, the UT Law School. <clears throat> Finally, in the early 1950s, public and private universities in the state began to integrate. Uh, there was an important Supreme Court ruling, Swate versus Painter, um, regarding admission to UT Law School. Mr. Swate was denied admission because he was black. He argued that, that he should be admitted. Um, this was a Supreme Court decision, and the Supreme Court said that um, it was not sufficient, that the University of Texas had tried to set up an alternate law school, which was, quote, equal, but it wasn't really equal, and Supreme Court ruled that he had to actually attend, be, be admitted to UT Law School. And then two years later, 1954, you had the famous Supreme Court decision, Brown, versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, which ruled that in educational institutions, the doctrine of separate but equal is unconstitutional because, and that doctrine had been set up in 1896 in the Plessy decision. So now we have the Supreme Court essentially is saying segregation in schools, in public schools, is unconstitutional. However, the situation didn't change the next day. <clears throat> in the primary and secondary schools, it took about 10 years in most of the South and most of Texas for there to be effective integration. <clears throat> in many, many school districts in East and Central Texas strongly resisted and white citizens' councils were set up originally in Mississippi to prevent black school children from going to the same schools as whites. And these white citizens' councils started to appear in Texas in 1955. Now, some school districts with very, very few black students integrated quickly and peacefully. And these were in South Texas and West Texas areas. There were some blacks but typically there were four or five blacks per school. Now the NAACP or the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People really pressed for the integration of a school in the small town of Mansfield, which is near Fort Worth in 1956. <clears throat> and when the school board refused to allow black students in the school and said they had to be uh, transported to schools in nearby Fort Worth, 
the NAACP went to court and they, they first of all, a federal judge upheld the Bansfield school system, but then the case was appealed to the Fifth Cir Circuit of Appeals, a federal court, and they, um, that court ordered the school to desegregate. Well, the result is mobs of angry white parents attacked the Mansfield, the, the community leaders in the small town of Mansfield. They physically blocked students from entering the school. And they, the blacks appealed to Governor Shivers for support, but he just did nothing. He just took no action. And President Eisenhower also decided not to intervene. Uh, the main issue apparently for Eisenhower was there was a national election that year and he did not want to lose support in the state of Texas. <clears throat> to make matters worse um, in Texas, in the following year, 1957, the Texas legislature passed laws that required local voters to approve school integration. And I might add that those laws were later uh, ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, but the fact that the Texas legislature passed the law is indicative of the feeling of many, many um, conservative Texans. So 10 years, that's, that's right, 10 years after the famous 1954 Supreme Court decision in the Brown case, less than 10% of black students in Texas actually attended integrated schools. It was only with passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act were black students able to um, attend integrated schools. That was because the Civil Rights Act gave the federal government the power to withhold funding um, if school districts didn't integrate. <clears throat> so by 1970, about 75% of black students in the state attended fully integrated or somewhat integrated schools. And the next year, the situation became better when, all, when the remaining all-black districts were merged with neighboring all-white districts. Now, looking at the Mexican-American or Latino population, they often were segregated into Spanish-language schools, um, particularly in the southern part of the state. Many didn't speak English well enough to study in English, and so they went to Spanish-language schools, um, and or they had neighborhood schools. <clears throat> now, in the 1930s, Mexican-Americans or Latinos were classified in Texas as, quote, colored people. That changed in the early 1950s, and they were classified as whites. And of course, today, the federal government considers Hispanics to be white, but with a, with a Hispanic ethnicity. So um, Hispanics can be other than white. You, of course, um, in Latin America, you have Asian Hispanics, such as former President Fujimori of Peru, uh, or you can have uh, black or uh, African heritage Hispanics, which you see in uh, various areas in the Caribbean and South America. But in Texas, um, a court order in 19, well, federal court order in 1960 said, let's eliminate this ethnic segregation from Mexican Americans. In practice, however, many Latinos live with their families in segregated areas. They had either been segregated because of discrimination or people coming from Mexico, you know, decided to live with their families in a certain area, particularly in the southern part of the state. And so most of the schools had Spanish language instruction. And that had the impact of keeping Latino and Anglo children separate. <clears throat> and finally, um, 
Henry M. Gonzalez was a very, very famous Mexican-American politician, and he was the first Mexican-American elected to the Texas Senate in 1956. He ran for governor in 1958, and he, he, he didn't win, but he ran for governor, and he was actually elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1961. Now let's just look very, very briefly at the overall situation in the 1960s. There was a lot of agitation for civil rights, and also there were many, many protests against U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. And so you had, <clears throat> you had riots in a number of cities in the 1960s, um, often by, by blacks uh, d demand, uh, demanding better treatment. Uh, and these riots were covered extensively on, on television news. You had civil rights some of the activists became more militant. Uh, some of them actually engaged in violence um, as opposed to Martin Luther King's uh, strategy of nonviolence. And then you had the Chicano movement, which is a very politicized uh, movement among the Latino community, uh, particularly in California. And there were many, many anti-Vietnam War protests. And so... This really provoked a major cultural conflict between generations with the older people looking at all of this activity as just, you know, beyond the pale. And in general, between liberals and conservatives and many people were concerned and claimed that, you know, American society was coming apart. So now you have a much, much more polarization between conservatives and liberals, and generally the older population tended to be more conservative. <clears throat> well, let's look quickly at 1957 to 1970. The Democrats hold on to office, but they're increasingly becoming vulnerable as the National Democratic Party moves uh, to be more liberal, and many, many conservative Democrats in Texas start to vote for and eventually will move into the Republican Party. <clears throat> but you have on the national stage, President Lyndon Johnson, um, who is viewed as very, very liberal. And this gives conservatives great concern. <clears throat> Sorry. And again, you have Lyndon Johnson and Ralph Yarborough representing the more liberal side of the Democratic Party. And this really risked alienating the Texas Democrats. And remember, Lyndon Johnson, of course, is from Texas. Now, in the 1960 presidential election, Lyndon Johnson had wanted to receive the Democratic nomination. And he ran against um, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, um, who eventually became the Democratic candidate. And everybody was shocked when Kennedy chose Johnson as his vice presidential candidate because they seemed so different personally and politically, particularly personally. Um, Kennedy was from a very, very wealthy Boston family, um, spoke very eloquently, had gone to Harvard. Uh, Linda Johnson was sort of gruff. Lyndon Johnson had been in the Senate. He um, was actually the Senate Majority Leader, a very powerful position in the Senate. And he was the kind of person who liked to drink a lot of whiskey, get together, drink whiskey, smoke cigars, and work out deals. But Kennedy wanted to obviously win the election, and he realized to win the election, he needed to, to win the electoral votes in Texas and some other Southern states. So to balance the ticket, as they call it, he decided to run with um, Lyndon Johnson. <clears throat> there was also a Republican candidate in 1960 was Richard Nixon. And many, many conservatives 
conservative Democrats in Texas supporting Richard Nixon. Well, Kennedy actually won Texas, but he won Texas by less than 50,000 votes, which is, was a very, very slim margin given all the votes cast. <clears throat> so Nixon lost Texas in 1960, but there was still strong Republican support in general in Texas, and some people think Kennedy would have lost Texas if he hadn't had Lyndon Johnson um, as his vice presidential candidate. Well, the next year, 1961, a Republican, a Republican, John Tower, was elected to the United States Senate. And there had been a special election because Lyndon Johnson had been a senator. And of course, when he was elevated to vice presidency, his Senate seat became vacant. And John Tower was the first Republican to represent Texas in the U.S. Senate since Reconstruction. So it had been, what's that, 60, 75, 75 odd years, and every Texas senator had been Democratic. So this is a major shift politically. And John Tower actually became very prominent in the Senate. He remained in the Senate until 1985, and he played a very, very important role, as we will see subsequent lectures, with the Republicans uh, coming to dominate the state of Texas. And here we have Senator Tower. <clears throat> well, after President Kennedy was assassinated, uh, Lyndon Johnson became president he one of his actions was he wanted to get NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, to move its headquarters from Virginia to Houston. And that's why we have NASA here in uh, South Houston, Clear Lake area. Uh, Johnson was very, very effective uh, politically. He'd been the Senate Majority Leader. Unlike Kennedy, Johnson knew how to work the Congress, and he was. It was thanks to him that uh, the nineteen you had the Civil Rights Act uh, passed. Kennedy had proposed it, but hadn't really worked enough with Congress to get it through. Well, Johnson ran for election in nineteen sixty four, and this disappointed many Republicans in Texas because Republicans in Texas realized, well, Texans would vote for Johnson because he was Texan, even though they might have preferred the Republicans. <clears throat> now, Senator Tower, as well as the Republican presidential candidate in 1964, Barry Goldwater, they opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is the major piece of legislation, of course. In the 1964 election, both Governor Connolly, who was Democrat, and President Johnson received huge majorities in Texas. And this is despite the fact that the conservative Texas Democrats started to leave the party and vote, vote for uh, the Republican candidate, Goldwater. Well, after being reelected, Governor Connolly and liberals in the state legislature um, started to increase funding for higher education, improve standards for teachers, and uh, fund the construction of new schools. And in 1966, Connolly was re-elected. <clears throat> well, on the national level, the Vietnam War became steadily more and more unpopular as it dragged on. And uh, so President Johnson and his administration became more unpopular, and uh, Lyndon Johnson's domestic program was called the Great Society, which he said was as important as the New Deal, and as well as his support for civil rights, that further alienated conservative Democrats in Texas. Now, President Johnson decided not to seek re-election in 1968, and this was largely because of the Vietnam War, um, in early 1968, at a time when Americans 
many Americans were confused as to why the United States was in Vietnam and never quite understood. Uh, there was a massive attack, simultaneous attack by the Viet Cong, the, the enemy that the United States was fighting. There was an attack in many, many cities in Vietnam at the same time. Um, and what it showed, it was on TV and it showed to Americans that there was little, if any, progress in Vietnam. <clears throat> so in 1968, uh, we have conservatives dominating the state Democratic primary election for governor and Preston Smith, um, who was very conservative, uh, became governor. <clears throat> um, Yarborough was not reelected a senator in 1970. And he, in fact, was defeated by a conservative, Lloyd Benson, in the primary. And then Lloyd Benson went on to be elected a senator um, and beating the Republican candidate, George H.W. Bush, who, of course, um, later became president of the United States. And in the 1970 governor's race, Preston Smith was reelected. <clears throat> So where are we now? We're in 1970. Um, I didn't mention in uh, 1968, Richard Nixon was elected president. And now you have internal division within the Texas Democratic Party with a major split between the conservatives and liberals, both at the state level and the national level in the Democratic Party. So the Republicans are gaining ground in Texas and they'll really have to wait a few more years until the 1970s to consolidate their gains in Texas. And we'll look at that and some other issues in the next lecture. Thank you very much.